We Barwon Health acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to the elders both past and present. We thank the traditional owners for the custodianship of the land and celebrate the continuing culture of the Wadawurrung people, acknowledging the memory of their honourable ancestors. We also welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. You ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Excellent. So question, is it okay to ask a person, are you Indigenous, instead of asking, are you Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander? I think it's important to ask whether you're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander because they're two different things. They're two different nations. They're Indigenous, but they're, you know, Torres Strait Islanders are different identified differently to Aboriginal people. So yeah, it is important to ask whether they're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, and sometimes you get both. I guess for me, I like to be asked if I'm Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, but it's different at work. So work is a whole different sort of set of questions. And of course at Barwon Health we need to ask because yeah. we need to make a record in the um, file, don't we, about yeah. whether this person identifies as Aboriginal Absolutely. or Torres Strait Islander. So it's very important for people to, to, to do that and for, for the answers to be recorded, especially where that might result in a person receiving um, particular preventative health assessments that, are, that might be Aboriginal specific. I prefer to be asked if I'm Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, but I know oh. that different, different people, depending on where they're from, perhaps in terms of the government or other organisations, they yeah. refer to... Indigenous, First yeah. Nations, yeah. Uh, and all are sort of acceptable, but I prefer to be asked if I'm Aboriginal or Torres Strait yeah. Islander. Um, or are you Koori or are you Murray? Mm. Um, and mm. I guess sometimes, you know, if you are being asked by other Aboriginal people and or other countrymen, then they might ask you Murray or Koori, depending on the state mm. that you come from. So yeah. it's more of an informal thing. Or even amongst ourselves, we say, who's your mob, where yeah. you're from, um, or yeah, are you black or, mm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, in written form, I, uh, uh, certainly within the workplace, I would encourage people not to use the acronym ATSI. Um, a lot of times people are, are offended by that, and it's either, I would encourage people to either use the fully expanded version of Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander in written form, or, or uh, Indigenous Australians or Indigenous uh, Victorians or the, the like, and, but certainly not just to stay away from using the, the ATSI acronym as a way of uh, describing people. More often than not, people don't like that. Another one. What do you think needs to happen to improve the issues around alcohol and family violence in Indigenous communities around Australia? Family violence is uh, about 30 to 40 per cent more um, prevalent in Aboriginal communities. I reckon I believe that's due to socio-economic determinants and um, lack of funding and services for people in need. And fund funding could change it for a lot of people in Australia, white and black, and we don't invest enough. Alcohol and violence is, is issues throughout the whole nation, um, not just with Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. So, And of course, um, violence, family violence is not part of Aboriginal culture. No. Aboriginal culture historically was um, collective, working together, looking after each other. Yeah, so violence absolutely. wasn't part of community. Alcohol is an Australian issue and it is very much Australian cultural society norm. Family violence, unfortunately, is very prevalent for everybody in this country. We get a bad rap in this space because our stats are so high, but that's because we suffer from so many of the social determinants that put us in that position. I also think that um, part of the way forward is for Aboriginal voices to be heard better by the powers that be, to listen more to the voices of community, to describe what the problems are as they see it for themselves, but also to identify solutions. 
I think that um, there's a place for non-Indigenous organisations to be helping in that area, though, mm. particularly around education and employment, yep. because um, people who are employed can support their families better and their um, stress can reduce in families with employment, education. Yeah. yeah, so I think there's a role for everyone to play in supporting Aboriginal communities. Yep, absolutely. Mm. What other countries around the world do a better job of honouring their Indigenous history? I guess one example is New Zealand. Yeah. They, they actually have a treaty um, and that's a document that's processed through Parliament that has an arrangement in acknowledging its true history. So within that treaty in New, in New Zealand, that actually provides um, ownership and governance of land and access to resources. And they've got one language, so it's, it's taught in the schools and, yeah. and everybody. I notice that when you go to different ceremonies or um, conferences and things, they're all very adept to uh, introducing themselves in Māori language. Mm. Some of the other areas that I've, I guess I've had some exposure to is some friends from other Indigenous nations around the world. Mm. And um, I've got some connections and friends with, with a woman in Canada and she often goes out and hunts for her food and um, goes uh, fishing in the, in the ice pools and they're able to get their food and um, source their uh, nutrition um, as the traditional way that they were taught. And some other areas that I've had some exposure with is around things like birthing on country. So yeah, different right. um, countries and nations, Indigenous nations around the world, yeah, have got really connected to some of those mm. traditional practices. How do you feel about the fact that children commonly learn French, Japanese and Spanish at school as opposed to languages from our First Nations people? Which ones did you read? You read French, Japanese and Spanish. They're really, really entrenched classical old world languages that have never ever been taken or changed or um, denied. So of course they exist a lot more strongly. The other thing that I would note in, in the question is that it refers to language as plural. So it's, it, it's important for people to realise that there's not one language for Aboriginal Australians. I would encourage people to do your Googles and have a look at some uh, language maps that you can find online to see just how many and where they all are and get a sense of those words that we were talking about in terms of how we refer to ourselves and where we're from and those kinds of things. Um, and some of those languages uh, have been, um, you know, I struggle with the word lost because it's too passive. They weren't lost. Denied. The, it's Stolen. What it, it needs to be stronger yes. language than lost. It was um, much more sad than that. Um, and the way in which we've been affected is directly. Um, and so in some, in some schools, I know that language is taught. Uh, and it's great that the you know in primary schools there's some kids and there's um, and there's different uh, kids are taught um, song lines and and, uh, and also um, uh, dreaming stories in language and that kind of stuff. So it's great there are there is work happening, but generally speaking, it's not it's certainly not a broad experience that, that all Australians would be exposed to Aboriginal yeah. languages. So. What would non-Indigenous people never understand about what it's like to be Indigenous? For me, as a non-Indigenous person, I th the thing that stands out is the racism. Working beside Aboriginal people, um, socialising beside Aboriginal people and with families, and I, I just can see bl the blatant racism when I'm, I'm with you people. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, it's, I don't think non-Indigenous people understand that it is uh, ongoing. And it's not all, um, when I say racism, I don't always mean that it's blatant. It's A lot of it is just unconscious bias. And people say the most appallingly rude things. Um, I was in a shop um, last week with uh, a, my Aboriginal friend and uh, the shopkeeper was asking us, um, so what are you um, up to today? And we said that we were going to go and visit some Aboriginal communities uh, in the southwest um, of Victoria. And she said, oh, I hope you're okay. Like, <laughs> what did she think was going to happen? It was unconscious bias in her understanding of her lack of safety around Aboriginal yeah. people. As somebody who um, was a latecomer to um, being told they were an Aboriginal person, the thing that 
most non-Indigenous people won't understand um, that I can say from, in my point of view is that I've never not been accepted as an Aboriginal person by Aboriginal people and that, that speaks a lot to me about the um, complexity and the, um, the connection of Aboriginal people to each other and I have to sort of explain that to people who aren't Indigenous why I would identify myself as an Aboriginal person when I don't have to, um, I don't look that way. And I'd say because they're the only people that really have always ever accepted me and never questioned that. They don't question me about how, what percentage white I am. They never ask that. When you're part of the mainstream, you don't have to question being part of that. No. You're not other. We're, we're the other. That's absolutely true. So we, we're constantly having to um, explain um, ourselves yes. uh, and, and in the in the concept of identity, mm. and that's something that um, I would say no Indigenous people, the, the, they'll never understand that because they never get They shouldn't, they never have to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I haven't experienced a whole lot of racism myself, but I know people that have. Um, but I have experienced people saying to me like, oh, you're not Aboriginal, you're too white to be Aboriginal. You're not, you know, dark enough skin. Um, and you, all these misconceptions and ideas and um, having it thrown in your face, you must get everything for free, you get free mm. housing, um, you get free cars. But I guess as well, there's um, non-Aboriginal people wouldn't necessarily have an understanding about the 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 shortened lifespan of our mob and, mm. you know, the just prevalence of disease, chronic disease, but also transgenerational trauma and how our mob yeah. are, have got things that are passed down from generation to generation for mm. years. And um, how that works. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. One of the things that's difficult that I guess I try and encourage my non-Aboriginal colleagues to appreciate for us is that we're walking in two worlds. We work in in a sector or an area, um, but we go home and we're still mm. living in the community. So we're working yeah. for our community and living in the community, which sometimes is really tricky. Um, yeah, sometimes you, it's hard to sort of draw a line mm. and sometimes there are none. I come from a strong line of, um, you know, really strong Aboriginal women and being um, second generation of stolen generation, I know I can think of four generations um, where these women were institutionalised and um, and had their babies removed. And I, th I think uh, the feeling that I get knowing that I come from those women is just, I can't even describe it. It's um, it's a magical feeling. Not Indigenous people have connection to place too, but it's, it's different to the way Aboriginal people connect to place and, and country. And I think... People always say, you know, to be on country. People use that word all the time. And some mobs are fortunate to live on country yeah. all the time and other people live away from where their country is for, for their mob and, and get back to those places when, when they can. Um, my Personally, my situation is that I live on Wathaurong country, but my mob are Yorta Yorta, which is up around on the Achukan in on the Murray River. And so I like to try to get back to that place when, when I can because I, this is not my country even though I live here. I feel like when I go back on country, my, my, my batteries get recharged and I, 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 the, the dirt is the right colour and the, the trees are the right shape and they smell the right way and the air tastes the right way. And it, it sustains me in a way that doesn't happen when I'm not there, yeah. which is really, you know. That's intrinsic. I don't think non-Indigenous people, to experience that same connection to place in, yeah. that, in that way, that's what I would say. Yeah. What are children being taught in Australian schools at this current moment in time about Indigenous history and how do you feel about that? I mean, I, when, when I was in high school, I was, you know, taught about Captain Cook coming and I think we had one page of, you know, Aboriginals, you know, in the background, but I know at the moment um, there is a cross -cur curriculum protocol happening around the schools at the moment. So um, we're hoping that you know teachers are including um, Aboriginal culture in the curriculum, and I think it is getting better. I've heard of you know some of my friends, um, kids at daycare coming home and singing Aboriginal songs, and um, I know that a lot of 
kinders and primary schools and high schools are celebrating, you know, the significant days. So yeah, I think it's getting better, but you know, there's a lot of room for improvement. Truth telling. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, telling the, the real story of what actually happened yes. here. Yes, yep. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, can, it will be confronting for kids, mm. but I think, you know, it is important for kids to learn the truth and what actually did happen and that, you know, it was an invasion, you know. It, yeah, like Libby said, it's truth telling mm -hmm. and it needs to be told. I'm wondering if, as a non Indigenous person, uh, it is okay for me to purchase and display Aboriginal artwork for my home. You have to know where it's coming from, um, you have to know the payment of the painting is actually going to the person. So, Working interstate, I've known of galleries that have paid $250 for someone to paint the painting, and they sold it for like $12,000. Wow. So that's like people getting really ripped off. Yeah. There's so many um, Indigenous sort of organisations and painting groups, and also a lot of remote communities have their own sort of artist um, organisations now. But also, you know, why stop at artwork? There's so, so know, many other ways to support baskets, Aboriginal business. There's weaved weaving, baskets. there's, yeah. you know, Aboriginal people have got other businesses, they're, they're multi-skilled and talented, they've got different um, areas and services and skills. We've got Aboriginal caterers, we've got mm. all sorts of Aboriginal landscape gardeners. So yes, yeah. artwork, but... Yeah. Um, why just supporting that, Aboriginal support businesses. Aboriginal businesses where yeah. the money and the profits are going back into community. Oh, this is a tough one. Is it true that Aboriginal children are being removed at high rates since the national apology to the stolen generations? It's one in six Aboriginal children are affected or um, by child protection services at some point. It's clear that, you know, Aboriginal children are still well and truly overrepresented by child protection and um, we have a higher removal rate. It's, it's clear, you know, so um, I don't think it's getting better. In Geelong, there were um, once upon a time many um, orphanages that existed. Too many. And lots of uh, Aboriginal children and, um, were placed in those orphanages as a result of having been removed from their families, um, in, as a result of um, various uh, government policies that were in effect um, at, at the time, even though the official policies were, were ceased in the sort of 70s, I think, around about there, there are still very many Aboriginal children who live uh, out of home. Uh, even in, here, especially. Even, even, even here in, in Geelong. Over 100. Over 100, which um, some people might be surprised to hear. I think um, there's some systemic racism in the way um, the, the authorities, the welfare, child protection view Aboriginal families quite differently from the way they perceive non-Indigenous families sometimes. So uh, the bar is um, very much higher for Aboriginal people. Yeah. The national apology was not, it, it didn't demonstrate any ceasing of people being um, re removed from their families and um, and, and living in out of home care, and certainly the, the numbers of children that we have in this area mm, tell us that. Yeah. Yeah, we need to be working hard as an organisation to support young mums, to support families, to support um, identification of um, career children, and then, yeah. Mm. And hope them. that they're being placed in kinship um, care mm. with, you know, other family members or at least a community placement.